Hello everyone. Today I want to talk to you about the perfect currency. What are some of the properties and values a perfect currency of the new digital world should have? And also we're going to take a look at traditional banking, the flaws that it has. This way we can see why Bitcoin was created because Bitcoin basically tried to solve a lot of these problems and has solved a lot of the problems with traditional banking, especially for this new modern world. But Bitcoin also has a few issues that prevent it from becoming a globally adapted cryptocurrency. So let's start with traditional finance and fiat currencies. We all know the United States dollar, the euro, the pound. These are what we call fiat currency. They have value because they are backed by a government. So these examples are being used right now, the dollar and the euro and the pound. But a lot of fiat currencies in the past have become extinct. They've mainly disappeared because of inflation. So the problem with a lot of these currencies is that the government can decide to print more money. And this causes inflation. The value of the currency goes down especially compared to goods and services, but also other currencies. So good examples of that is, for instance, the Bolivar in Venezuela. So there's a few countries where the entire economy has collapsed because the government keeps printing money. Something similar even happened in Germany in the last century, and it happened countless times in the entire history of mankind. This is one of the major problems with currencies today, is that the value of a nation's currency is in control of the government. They can decide the value by printing more or less money. And we all know that we can't really trust the government with this kind of responsibility. I mean, we've seen it in the past and we're seeing it right now as well. So the main critique that people have against fiat currencies, no central authority should have the power to decide when and how much inflation occurs. Another critique of fiat currencies is that there's a lot of centralized institutions that have power over digital transactions. So this is why cryptocurrency is often called digital cash. And we'll explain why in a little bit. So with physical money, you can basically transact from one person to the other directly with no one in between. And you can keep this physical currency at home as well. So dollar bills or coins you can just store at home. And there's no institution involved. You don't need a bank to store it. But with fiat currencies, digital transactions become a problem and storing your money digitally. So to do this, you need a bank because you can't make a digital payment without banks in between when it comes to fiat currencies. And this is a problem because then you have centralized institutions between the transactions. This shows how the traditional finance system is not made for the digital world. It is an outdated system that tries to keep up but can't. So it creates middlemen that are unnecessary to transact from one person to the other. And one of the big issues people have with these centralized institutions like banks is that they can freeze your funds or they can block certain transactions from happening. You need to give your money to another person just to store it for you. Now people used to get a lot of interest over money that they stored on the bank, which was good. Then at least they got some money out of it as well. But that's not really the case anymore. And it's even worse, you now have negative interest rates. So when you have stored a lot of money on the bank, you have to pay money for them to keep your money for you. It's, it's weird. So now that you, you can see that one of the main issues is centralized authorities like banks and governments. That's the problem with fiat currencies. With these centralized authorities, especially governments that can decide the value of a currency, is that other governments don't want another government to have control over their currency and their economy. And that's why each government has their own currency. And this also creates sort of a problem for transacting globally, worldwide. If you want to send money to someone in a different country, you need to pay very high fees for them to send it overseas to a different bank with a different currency and then also change the currencies. So to summarize, the biggest issues with fiat currencies are there is a centralized authority that can decrease the value of money by printing more money. History proves that this is a problem and that governments can't be trusted with this responsibility. Furthermore, fiat currencies are not adapted to the digital world because unlike cash transactions, 
there is a centralized authority, so banks, that can block your transactions. And there is also a centralized authority that can freeze and take your savings. Centralized currencies also prevent governments from adopting a global currency, which is very inconvenient for transactions to other countries. So ideally, for a perfect currency of the future and a global currency, these problems need to be solved. So now, let's take a look at how cryptocurrency solves some of these issues. Many attempts have been done to try and create a digital currency that is decentralized, but it wasn't until 2009 that Satoshi Nakamoto succeeded. No one knows who this is, if it was a, an individual or a group of people, but this person created Bitcoin. So the main problem that we have seen with the traditional finance system is centralization. So what we basically want to do is decentralize the entire finance system. This means that there is no central entities that can control who can transact with who, take money or change the value of the currency or make decisions about the currency. Such a currency can be globally adopted because no single government has control over this currency. How is this done with Bitcoin? How is there no central authority that makes rules? How is there no central authority that processes the transactions? Well, this is done with distributed ledger technology or DLT for short. Bitcoin uses a blockchain. It's basically a list of transactions and these transactions are stored on thousands of computers all over the world. These computers check each other all the time to make sure they are all on the same page. They have the same transactions in their list. It makes sure that there is no central authority like a bank that performs the transactions or stores your money digitally. It is all on the blockchain. Now all these computers, they all run on the same rules. So there's no one that can change the amount of coins in circulation. The first problem, the printing of money, is now solved because there's no central authority that can change the inflation rate of the coins in the Bitcoin network. Following these rules, there can only be 21 million Bitcoin in existence ever. Furthermore, because this is a decentralized network, there is no one central authority that can decide who can transact and who can't. But also, because this system is decentralized and there is no one government that can print more money or decide the rules of the system, this Bitcoin blockchain could be adopted all over the world and create a global digital currency. So that sounds perfect, right? I mean. It's a digital payment network that can be adopted all over the world, completely decentralized. What more do you want? Well, there's a few problems with the Bitcoin network. Some problems appear when we look at how transactions are recorded on this blockchain. So first of all, a blockchain consists of blocks that are chained together and these blocks are groups of transactions, but there can only be so many transactions in one block and a block is only created every 10 minutes. There's a limit to how many transactions per second Bitcoin can do. So payment processor Visa can do about 1700 transactions per second, while the Bitcoin network can do 4.6 transactions per second. It creates a queue in the Bitcoin network. So a lot of people that want to transact, but it's not their turn yet to be in the next block. You can, however, jump in front of the line by paying a higher transaction fee. They compete for a place in the next block by overbidding each other when it comes to transaction fees. So the transaction fees get higher and higher. As of writing, the average transaction fee is about two and a half dollars per transaction. That might not seem like a lot of money, but it is when you just want to buy a coffee. It's also a lot of money for some people in less wealthy regions of the world. For some, it's a day's work. To attach a new block to the blockchain, miners need to find a magic number, let's say. So finding that magic number is called mining. To find this magic number, a lot of processing needs to be done. Having more processing power increases your chance of finding this magic number, but that costs a lot of electricity. So transactions times are slow and fees are very high, and that is not very convenient for a global digital payment network. So the main problems are that it is not scalable, it has low transactions per second, the transaction fees increase with demand, and there's very long confirmation times. Furthermore, Bitcoin's consensus mechanism wastes a lot of resources and is often seen as bad for the environment. 
Another problem is that this also incentivizes centralization because the person with the most processing power finds the most blocks, gets the most rewards and can then buy more processing power to find more blocks, get more rewards. So this is a never ending cycle that leads to centralization over time. Mining is an energy intensive process that is not very efficient and the awards associated with mining lead to centralization over time. This makes Bitcoin, or how Bitcoin currently works, unusable as a global digital payment network. So now let's look at the perfect currency. What are the most important factors that we have to consider to find the perfect currency for the future? So first of all, decentralization, of course, which is what we discussed before. Next, scalability. It needs to be fast because we want to buy coffee with this currency. We don't want to wait in line because we need to wait 30 minutes for our transaction to go through. We also don't want any transaction fees. If I buy my coffee and it's two euros, I want to pay two euros, not two euros and 10 cents for the transaction fee. It needs to be able to handle a lot of transactions per second. Furthermore, we also want this to be a very efficient network, no resources wasted on mining. Especially with global warming, we don't want to spend more electricity on transactions if it's not necessary. And also we want the network to decentralize over time not centralized. So which currency fits best in all these requirements? And Nano uses a different approach than the traditional blockchain called a DAG or a directed acyclic graph. So with this approach, instead of having one blockchain that a lot of transactions get put into blocks, everyone has their own blockchain with each block just containing one transaction. So no one has to wait to get their transaction included into a block. This removes waiting times and a queue for transactions and removes fees to cut in front of the line. Validators do not get a monetary reward for validating transactions like miners do in Bitcoin. This means there's no inflation at all with Nano. Validators are incentivized to protect the network and make sure everyone is playing a fair game because they use the network themselves and they want to make sure everyone on the network is using it fairly. So let's say you're a big company and you accept Nano. You definitely want to make sure that transactions are legit because people are paying you in Nano. Uh, that's an incentive to run a node because then you can actually see the transactions for yourself and make sure they went through properly. Now these validators don't need to find some magic number like miners do in Bitcoin. So they also don't need to spend a lot of processing power and a lot of electricity. Now all of this means that it's very easy to run a node in the nano network and also means that it decentralizes easily over time because people don't need to create giant mining farms like they do with Bitcoin. This is also why nano is often seen as a green coin, one that is good for the environment. One person did some research that showed that the entire network can run on one wind turbine, which is amazing to me. So furthermore, to prevent spamming, Nano uses very innovative new ways, like the amount of time you have to wait for a new transaction is based upon the amount of Nano you have. So if you have a lot of Nano, you can make many transactions, but when you don't own a lot of Nano, you can't make that many transactions per second. So you basically have sort of a waiting time between making new transactions, but the more nano you own, the less time this is. So we have fast transactions with no transaction fees. It can handle many transactions per second. It's good for the environment, or at least not bad for the environment. There's no inflation and no mining, and it's completely decentralized, even decentralizing over time. What more do you want from a currency? So I think Nano fits the perfect currency requirements best. And it's really interesting to see how the Nano Foundation is making so much innovation in this cryptocurrency space, because that's what crypto should be about. It's about innovation. And a lot of other coins are just copies of Bitcoin with small changes. And I think that's not really what innovation is about. Innovation is about finding new ways. And that is what Nano does. So it's very interesting to me. So I have to say, to me, Nano is pretty close to a perfect currency. I will make some more videos about Nano, but also other stuff in the future. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.